In the EPA case, uh, the, the Environmental Protection Act, the Clean Water Act, all, you know, all these others are, are quite clear about what the statute is saying. The statute mm -hmm. is saying air pollutants are an existential threat to uh, the people, people living in the United States. Right. And therefore, the EPA is empowered to devise systems in order to, regulatory systems in order to bring those air pollutants down within you know, acceptable levels. Uh, EPA, you know, has, and then there's a, the Air, Air Quality Act, you know, Clean, Clean Water Act, a bunch of other you know, ratifying and expanding acts over the time. And each time that Congress appropriates money for the EPA, they're essentially ratifying their earlier mission. So for 50 years, Congress has been saying this is the goal of the EPA. This is what we want the EPA to do. But you have the majority this time saying, well, no, actually, we don't want them to do that. So on the one hand, DHS is required by this reasoning to carry out a mission. On the other hand, EPA is not allowed to carry out the very specific mission that Congress gave it unless Congress passes a brand new law that says, no, 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 all the things that we said before that we wanted to do, we really meant that. Like, you really have to do that. Uh, which seems to me a, that they've given up even trying to be consistent about the stuff, that it's all results oriented mm -hmm. and then working backwards from there. Well, I think that's generally a problem with our, our Supreme Court these mm -hmm. days anyway. But I would say uh, that th this is a really interesting excerpt from Justice Kagan's uh, dissent in the EPA case. She said, members of Congress often don't know enough and know they don't know enough to regu regulate sensibly on an issue. And then she continues, members of Congress often can't know enough and again, <laughs> no, they can't to keep regulatory schemes working across time. And I think what she's getting at there is sort of the heart of the political divide um, in many, many ways over the scope of government, the scope of the administrative state, the federal government. Um, because if you have something like the EPA, I think the conservative justices were saying, this is a dr such a dr dramatic policy that you need to have congressional authority in order to carry it out legally. But what Justice Kagan is saying is this exists, this massive regulatory agency exists to regulate. That's how. That's why it exists. Um, and the conservative justices are getting at this idea that I think kind of, we've talked about this before, it actually kind of cuts at the foundation of the administrative oh, yeah. state. Um, I forget what case we were talking about last year, but it was- It was about the SEC and I think the Fifth Circuit. Right. Where they basically said the SEC isn't constitutional. It's illegitimate, yeah, it's constitutionally it's illegitimate. three judges in the, in the Fifth Circuit, right. Yeah, different than the Supreme right. Court, of course. But um, I, I actually think this case really got at that too, um, is that like if it is not an enumerated power for the EPA, then Congress must enumerate right. the power in order for the EPA to exercise it. Right, and the way that the EPA's design is says, okay, at the time of the creation, we know about these air pollutants, these are a problem. But the EPA is also empowered to identify through these processes, new air pollutants. And there's, there are checks and balances on that. They had to go Massachusetts first EPA or whatever it was. Um, there was a Supreme Court case that said, okay, yes, carbon dioxide does count as an air pollutant. This is courts, the courts affirmed that. I think a lot of people on the right might be like, well, you know what, screw the EPA, fine. <laughs> A lot, so let's try to take a different one. Say the Federal Reserve. Now sure. you've got the Ron Paul crowd who's gonna be like, yeah, that's right, Fed, the Fed is yeah, unconstitutional. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Ron Paul crowd aside, the Federal Reserve established in what, 1914, and given a mandate, and then in the 1970s is given this dual mandate. Its, it's dual mandate is to uh, do you know, full employment and to keep price stability. And the, this new Supreme Court idea would suggest that Every time there's kind of a new economic circumstance, let's say a pandemic. Or immigration circumstance. Or an immigration circumstance, or a shipping crisis, you know, where you're getting bottlenecks. And, you know, this, and so the types of inflation and the types of employment issues, or automation, are different than in 1914 when the Federal Reserve was created. You'd have people saying, well, the Federal Reserve's interest rate hike here, or their quantitative easing, or their or their uh, re repro, repro buybacks, or whatever program that they're doing to meet their mission of full employment and price stability is unconstitutional because these members of Congress in 1914 didn't foresee that we'd have a pandemic, not just in 1919, but again in 2020, or they didn't foresee that we'd have a, a shipping crisis at the same, you know, that, that coincided with the pandemic, 
uh, or a supply chain crisis or, we, or the concentration of, of purchasing power on the internet. So, mm -hmm. they'd, you know, so they'd say, well, now Congress has to write brand new Federal Reserve Acts, like mm -hmm. bra brand new laws every time that the Federal Reserve has to confront new economic circumstances that it hasn't precisely dealt with in the past. And that is just a recipe for an ungovernable society, which I think is actually the goal of a, the kind of Lochner era element here, that they don't want the government to be able to govern. <laughs> well, here's a relevant excerpt from Alito's dissent in the Remain in Mexico case. He says, due to the huge numbers of aliens who attempt to enter illegally from Mexico, DHS does not have the capacity to detain uh, all inadmissible aliens encountered at the border. And no one suggests that DHS must do the impossible, but rather than avail itself of Congress's clear statutory alternative to return inadmissible aliens to Mexico while they await proceedings in this country, DHS has concluded it, that it may forego the option altogether and instead simply release into this country untold numbers. Um, and yeah, so you, so you can say he then continues, this practice right. violates the clear terms of the law, but the court looks the other way. And I think it's mentioning Ron Paul and the Federal Reserve is, extremely interesting in this context because I think probably um, there's a good argument that in a, a narrow originalist interpretation of the Constitution that is completely correct. The Ron Paul take on the Fed is completely correct and in a very narrow um, originalist interpretation of the Constitution it is very difficult to see how a, a massive organization like the EPA which in a country that is high-tech and globalized and interconnected in a way now that it was wasn't then in a way that like air pollution is is something that like we have to have international cooperation with in order to make a dent in it. It's not as though states can really regulate that in a way that doesn't affect mm -hmm. the whole country. Um, so yes, I mean it's it's just very difficult to build that on a proper constitutional foundation. And I think um, you still you, you very much that's that's what's revealed in in these arguments. Although not that hard. So it's, it's definitely true that you can find people who were around at the time of the founding, mm -hmm. Madison, let's say, Monroe, uh, who would say, yeah, no, none of this is legit. But you could also find people like Hamilton, yes. who was yep. another co-author of the Constitution and the Federalist Papers, who's like, who would, who would, if he were alive today, he'd be like, of course the Federal Reserve oh, is yeah. good, EPA is good, all of these all things are good. There's this great letter between, I think it's Madison Mon and Monroe, uh, complaining about how uh, Hamilton is starting to like build canals. Yes, he's starting to fund canals under a, what maybe was a general welfare uh, clause, and and Ma and Madison's like the federal government funding <laughs> like canal projects. We can this is this is an outrageous expansion. So who's the originalist? Is it Hamilton or is it is it Madison? Yes. And, and Hamilton's like, are you insane? How are we going to have a country if we don't build canals? How are you going to get to Erie? Imagine, imagine explaining gain of function research to Madison. <laughs> Madison, would be like, he, Madison would be like, hey, whatever anybody wants to do, they just do. Right. You know, can't have laws. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, but they, like it's it's absolutely true, and I, I think the the originalist interpretation, as it's been adopted on the right, is obviously. Madisonian. Right, they want to go to particular people at the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think that's true. Um, and the argument would be that those Imagine particular... Hamilton coming back and being like, wait, originalist as in me? Like, I was, I was there, <laughs> and you all are completely wrong about this. Although, I mean, Hamilton wasn't exactly... It, it, it is very hard, and this is what people like Kagan and Sotomayor get at. It is very hard to apply some of the writings to what we look at now. If you t are talking about things like air pollutants that are post-industrial, and are not only across state lines, but across international borders in ways that really matter, um, really, really matter. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that conversation is inappropriately, like lacks the nuance that it probably needs, um, but it, it is very difficult to sort of go back and think about how you could even apply a lot of that. Right, and I think they're not even really trying. They're just, they just have, they don't like the EPA and they're like, what, how, what, what grounds can we use to undo this? You know, it's an interesting question because it, it goes to what we do about the Supreme Court period. Like a lot of people on the left say, well, there's nothing about nine justices. Let's pack the court. Let's do this, this and this. And I still think that the wisdom of the founding documents is the balances of the system. Um, and that, I think, it's not a limited government necessarily or a, a big government thing. It's a balanced government. Um, but it's getting thrown wildly out of balance. 
think there's an argument for that. Yeah. And I think actually part of the argument, I, mean, I, I would say like the, the uh, use of a lot of these policies at the border is uh, a good example of that. I would say we still have the AUMF that was authorized after 9-11. I mean, it's being abused in, in different directions because we're so wildly off course. Yeah, yeah, had it right for the ditch. <laughs> yes.